Hi, so today will be a two-part series for our safety planning video. I want to start by saying that this video is intended more so for people who might be supporting individuals who are in abusive home environments. And it is done in two parts specifically for the fact that there is information in this video for someone who may have experienced um, sexual or interpersonal violence or currently is experiencing sexual or interpersonal violence that may be triggering to them. So if at any point when you are watching this video, you feel those sorts of feelings or you need to be take a break, please feel free to do so. If you need to get linked with resources uh, at any point in time, please reach out to us at title.ix at plattsburgh.edu. And you can also see on our social media pages, our Plattsburgh State uh, Media webpage presence, links to resources in our area. Uh, also, if you're using the state uh, system or the state resource system, the uh, SAVR, that will give you specific information to resources in your area if you just put in a zip code. So that link and that information is also available on their web. And I will put a link to that resource within this video on our YouTube channel as well. So as getting started, I'm going to pull up a PowerPoint or a Google Slides presentation that will correspond what I want, with what I want to speak to you about. In addition to this video, there will be a separate video that is geared more towards individuals who want to develop a safety plan who, or who are currently living in an abusive environment and would like information on uh, coping skills, so how to um, cope in the environment they're in if they aren't yet ready to leave or they cannot leave, and uh, additional information on how to leave uh, if and when they are ready. Uh, so what I want to start from the beginning by saying as ter terms of our central focus is that the idea of a safety plan or what we should be thinking about in general, if someone comes to us to report that they're experiencing or sexual interpersonal violence, is the importance of empowering individuals uh, to move towards either a safer environment or the safest environment for them and to leave an abusive environment if they're ready. It is important to focus on autonomy and empowerment because abusive relationships are about taking control away. So if someone comes to you in a situation where they are experiencing violence and they feel as though you are imposing upon them your beliefs or values or telling them what, telling them what they should or should not do, it is really in a way using similar tools that their abuser is using. So again, a safety plan is centrally focused on empowerment um, and to meeting the person where they're at. Uh, most people, when someone reports to them that they're experiencing violence in their mind, which hopefully they're not communicating out loud, they're thinking to themselves, you've got to get out of there. Why are you staying there? And the reasons that people stay are much more complicated than that. But we also need to be prepared right from the onset that we may not be able to help this person get out of this unsafe environment, or at least might not be able to do so now. So it's important that you stay focused on that um, as well and you stay present and, uh, and get the support that you need as well. So things for you to think about in terms of sexual and interpersonal violence, specifically someone who might be in an abusive relationship. Domestic and interpersonal violence do not discriminate based on someone's identity. So there's often these stereotypes that we have when we think about biases, whether it's a bias about someone's identity, their race, ethnicity, religion, class, education, or so on. But additionally, we have those biases and stereotypes when it comes to looking at interpersonal violence. People from all different backgrounds, all socioeconomic status, all different types of identities experience violence. And additionally, likewise, people of all different identities uh, are also uh, the people, can be the people who are engaging in violence against others. So that's something important to keep in perspective too, because often you will either have blatant information that tells you that someone is abusive or that someone is in an abusive relationship, or you might have hints or signs and our biases can come into play there. If we don't think that the person being harmed meets this stereotype that we have in our heads or that society gives us. Or additionally, if the person that is being accused of causing harm 
also doesn't fit those stereotypes that we're often fed through um, the narratives in the media or in um, just our day-to-day -day lives. So keep in perspective that there, it does not discriminate. It happens to people across all spectrums, across all intersections of identity, and it's important to keep that in perspective. Another thing to keep in perspective is that uh, there is something called the cycle of abuse. So when I went, spoke a little bit earlier about us thinking in our minds, why would someone stay? Why would they tolerate this type of behavior? If it were me, I would leave. And the fact of the matter is you really don't know what you would do until you're in that situation. And I would hope that no one would need to be in that situation, but it's easy to say something when we're not living it day to day. It's also complicated by the fact that most people who cause harm are people that are close to us. So people that we love, people that we care about, partners, parents, uh, siblings, uh, extended family members, uh, coworkers, the, the list can really go on and the relationships can be complex and different in each scenario. So it's important to understand that those cycles keep that violence going um, and, and they're, they're important when we're trying to, in our mind, rectify why someone might stay in these situations. And so um, in a time when we are in a pandemic and we are stuck in our homes and we are isolated, we do know that hotline calls are going up during this time. Across the nation, that's what's being reported by hotlines. Uh, what we also know is that it's going to be much harder to leave those situations when you don't have as many places to go. So for example, if someone's experienced violence, experiencing violence in the home and their only escape was college and they can't be on their college campus now, they no longer have that escape. If for someone who has an abusive partner, their escape was that eight hours a day that they are at work and they can no longer go to work, that compounds that problem. It's also compounded by the fact that if we're in the state of isolation and we're already feeling very hypervigilant and anxious about what's going on in the world or what's going on with health or our safety on a whole spectrum of issues, it's going to, to be much more difficult to leave. And resources at this time for many are limited as well, which can be a major reason why people stay in those situations. So that is something else that I would want you to think about as we're covering this. This looks at kind of that cycle of violence and the way that things can happen in abusive situations. So you'll have the point where we look at the acute explosion. So this is where the abuse happens. But what people don't always recognize is all of the buildup to that or the things that happen uh, before and after that that keep individuals experiencing violence in that cycle of violence. So you'll have that explosion occur, which might be physical, it might be emotional, it might be sexual, it might be a combination of all of those things. And you, that person experiencing that, violent and that violence in that mo moment in time will react in an individual way as well. So some people might fight back, some people might freeze. Some people might curl up into a ball and do nothing. Some might seek support. Some might not want to talk to anyone. So the reaction that that person is having in that moment in time is much different, uh, is across the spectrum and much more complicated than we think of as well. And then generally when we think about the cycle of violence, what happens because we are dealing with relationships where there is some basis or there has been at some point some basis of trust some basis of love um, some basis of, of loyalty or connection or all different types of things that people might value in their interpersonal relationships we then often see after the abuse happens a honeymoon period or a period in time where the person who's caused harm is saying things like I didn't mean to do it I promise I'll never do it again um, they're giving them gifts. They're going to counseling. Uh, they're talking about ways in which they will change. They're out there telling other people how wonderful they are. They're crying out to family members like, I can't believe I did this. I need help. Please, I don't want you know this person to leave me. And then a response to that, because the person who's experiencing the violence loves that person and cares for that person, and is just really stuck in this complicated cycle of trying to figure out what it is that they're even stuck in, uh, they might agree to stay. They might agree to wait. 
because the other thing you have to think about in abusive relationships is the fear of what happens after those abusive relationships. While you might be in a situation that is unsafe, unhealthy, uh, not enriching to your personal growth and development, you also get into a space where you know what to expect. And what you don't know, often in those situations where you're contemplating leaving or dreaming about leaving or planning about leaving, is what life looks like after you leave. So in that honeymoon phase, that's where some hope creeps back in and where this fantasy building happens of maybe this person will change and maybe this will get better and maybe they really didn't mean it. And you kind of get sucked back in. And then slowly it goes back up to this tension building of uh, pulling back those tactics, control, isolation, belittling, because much of what's going on in an abusive relationship, whether or not the person is a partner or a parent or uh, someone you have a business relationship or so on and so forth, is they are working pretty skillfully and often in ways that wouldn't get them legally in trouble, wouldn't get them in, in really any, often in ways that you can't document, um, that they're manipulating. So they are working to psychologically, psychologically and emotionally break someone down to the point that they feel really that this person is the only person they have or that they don't deserve better than this or that there is nowhere else for them to go. So people in this abusive cycle, aside from experiencing the abuse and aside from all the techniques that someone might use, begin to lose a sense of themselves or their identity. And that is that, that ongoing um, manipulation and ongoing abusive tactics that are happening specifically in that tension build, building period. And even in that honeymoon period, because it's manipulative, that person does not intend to change. That is a tactic to keep that person there, to keep them present, to allow the abuse to continue to go on. So that attention building goes back, we get back to the abuse and the cycle just keeps going on going. Additionally, cycles of violence are generational. So what I mean by that is, you'll often see generations of family where you could maybe find a mother, daughter, sister, father, son, so on and so forth, uh, maybe crossing gender binaries completely, um, where from generation to generation, you'll see individuals who are, are getting sucked into these abusive patterns or relationships. And they're not broken because that's what the, the example was that was present and that's what people are seeing. And it can lead to these internalized um, belief systems about relationships and about self-esteem and about um, what healthy communication and healthy partnering actually looks like. So again, these are cycles in an individual scenario. These are generational cycles. These are systemic cycles. This abuse, cycle of abuse, which we could get into in a whole different conversation um, or session, can are within systems. They're within the structures of, of systems, whether you're looking at a, or, a local organization, a regional organization or a national organization. They are within the systems that we often speak about when we're talking about oppression and violence and discrimination in that intersection of identity. So it is just so much more complicated than even the individual experience and that compounds someone's ability to leave. So what you, and I talked about this before, it is about power and control. And so we want to, in any way that we can, surrender any judgment, surrender any power or control if someone comes to us and discloses that they're experiencing violence. And the other thing to think about and keep thinking about, sometimes safety planning isn't a plan to leave. It is a way to survive someone's current environment. So the person coming to you may have no intention of leaving where they are, they just are starting to take steps moving forward to think about how they can handle better the situation they're in or what they can do if and when they get to the point of being ready to leave. So if you're a support person, you need to prepare yourself pretty quick to process and cope with the fact that the person may not be ready to leave that abusive environment. Uh, you want to look for signs that people might be giving to you, again, in an unbiased lens. So things, examples of this, not to say or not to be thinking or to process with yourself with some self-reflection is 
you know, so-and-so is a professional, this couldn't be happening to them. There are plenty of successful, well-educated individuals who are in abusive environments. And that, again, abuse does not discriminate. And people in those situations sometimes are going to be less likely to seek support because they in some way might internalize the abuse that they're experiencing as something wrong with them, or that that may damage the, uh, the presence or the um, persona that, that the community or that others have of them. Additionally, a lot of people have a hard time really wrapping around their head around the fact that someone that they know and met and like could hurt anyone. And the thing that you have to think about is abusive people are pretty good at posturing in situations uh, where they need to make people think that they are good people. And again, you know, this isn't a completely black or white issue. And what I mean by that is there are gray layers to this. Good people do bad things. Bad people do good things. There, it's not ever just as clear as that. So just because you see someone being very good or you see functioning in in, with integrity in one area of their life, it does not mean that they are not causing harm to others. So that is, again, a very complicated part of this and something that's difficult for people to rectify because in some ways by you validating the experience that someone that's being abused by someone that you like is in essence you needing to come to terms with the fact that this person isn't who you thought they were either. Um, so, so that's something to keep in mind. Other things to look about for, abuse is not always physical, it's not always sexual, it's often verbal, psychological, financial, it's often very hidden. Uh, this may include stalking, so cyber stalking, it could be showing up to where someone works, uh, you know, emailing, tracking on social me media, location tracking, video tracking, trying to connect with someone through third party. Uh, many of the tactics that abusers use are not illegal. And I think that's really important to pause and think about because one of the most difficult things to hold someone accountable for is abuse, whether it's interpersonal or sexual, because the burden of proof really falls on the person experiencing the violence. And much of what the person is, is doing is tedious, it's small, it's building up, and it's much harder to, to characterize. Um, and it might, not, it might always teeter that line of not breaking any sort of laws or rules. Um, and that is often very intentional and calculated. Additionally, people don't always trust our systems of justice and they are built to respond to an incident, not necessarily a pattern of behavior. They're not always sophisticated enough to pick up on patterns and respond effectively to interrupt those patterns. So what I mean by that, again, if someone's been really towing the line and they are emotionally abusing their partner or they are you know, uh, manipulating them with money or with, um, whatever tactics that they're using, those might build up and build up and build up in a way that this experience is so much more uh, traumatic for the person that's experiencing it. But the justice system is responding to usually one incident at a, at a time, not the buildup of that incident. So they don't always, um, the justice system doesn't always serve uh, individuals who've experienced sexual or interpersonal violence, which is often a barrier to reporting because you imagine experiencing all this trauma over and over again and having to talk about it over and over again and having to document it really, you know, how are you going to document or how can we expect or how reasonable is it to expect that someone experiencing violence is going to be in a position um, with time or energy, all different types of things to actually be giving the justice system what they need in many of these instances to hold the person accountable. So you looking, watching, paying attention can help a lot in these situations. So the next 10 slides are signs of unhealthy relationships and they were developed by the One Love Foundation. Zyasia Nadler, who is our violence prevention, education and outreach coordinator, she partners with the Love One, One Love Foundation and provides webinars and trainings on campus 
uh, in regards to this. So if you are interested in those one-on-one -on -one trainings or group trainings, please reach out to Zyasia. Um, and she, I know, would be happy to help you with that. So the first of those signs is intensity. Uh, so when, sometimes when someone might present as being too good to be true or just very, you know, out there with their personality or their feelings about persons, uh, person or people or things, that can sometimes be a red flag that it is in some ways a veil um, or something to distract you from what might be going on behind that. So that intensity or in a romantic relationship, that kind of fast and furious, just met, really moving quickly, that could be a sign, a warning sign um, of abusive tactics, abusive relationship, or something that could lead to an abusive relationship. Possessiveness. So um, many times in abusive relationships, the abuser wants to isolate the individual from someone else. So if it's a romantic partner, they might want to not have them be around their family or friends. Uh, because the risk in that is if you start talking to your family and friends about what this person is doing, you might figure out that what they're doing is wrong and then you might leave them. So it is a clear tactic to maintain control. Additionally, often a person who is abusive will want to try to convince you that it's you and them against the world, against everyone else. Basically, they want to plant a seed that you can't trust anyone else, that the only person you can trust is them. Um, so it's that possessiveness and that control to try to make you think that they are, are really looking out for you um, and they really care about you. Manipulation. So this can come and present in many different ways. So it could be someone telling you what to do or trying to tell you what to do, trying to tell you how you're feeling when you haven't expressed to them how you're actually feeling. It could be like triangulating uh, information between people. So meaning um, telling one person one thing, telling you another thing, telling you that person said another thing and trying to work that manipulation to again, uh, sever relationships and create uh, feelings of, of um, doubt uh, between you and those other relationships or those other people. So manipulation can creep in in a lot of different ways and is often one of the beginning signs of, of what will be or is an abusive relationship. Isolation, that goes back to the idea of possessiveness, so keeping someone away from friends, family, or other people. Uh, sabotage, so purposely going out and saying things about someone that's not true, or it could look like um, in terms of you know, setting you up to fail at things, saying, oh yes, I'm gonna help you do this, but in reality, I'm not really going to give you the tools to do what it is that you are trying to do. And additionally, um, it could be an effort to make sure that you are not successful. But on the surface, it looks like, and this person might present as showing people that they want you to be successful, that they are in your corner. But in reality, they're doing things and putting barriers in your way so that you can never truly be successful. Uh, belittling could be happen in person, it could be more covert things in, in public. So putting someone down, such as telling them they're not good enough or telling them that you know, you'll know you never do that or that's a stupid idea or in public um, making someone feel less than. So it could be publicly calling someone out on something. Um, I know I once I was um, in presence of someone who it was an abusive partner and we were out in public and the abusive partner kept saying to their, their, that person, like, look at what you're doing. Look at how you're embarrassing yourself in front of other people to again, try to, to make them feel very small and to make it seem like everyone else thinks the way that they, that the abuser's thinking versus the fact that we all were pretty mortified at how this person was being treated. Um, guilting. So making someone feel responsible for their actions, uh, making you feel like it's your job to help them be happy or to change them or to help them be a better person. Again, this is, is a very complex thing that can come up. Um, anger, unpredictable reaction. So not ever knowing who you're gonna get in that situation. So it might be a person who a lot of the time is very stable and very calm and kind 
but then in a different environment, um, you are kind of walking on eggshells. So being scared, confused, or intimidated, and realizing that they are doing the power. Um, additionally, this might be deflecting responsibility. So someone who is abusive often won't ever take personal accountability. They will come up for reasons why they do the things they do. For instance, well, I wouldn't have said that to you if you had done X, Y, or Z, or I wouldn't have hurt you if you hadn't made me feel this way, or, oh, well, I didn't do that by that time because you forgot to, to remind me. It was your responsibility to tell me what to do. So a deflection of responsibility is also a sign of abusive relationship. Uh, betrayal would be, again, maybe triangulating, telling one person something behind your back and then saying something else to your face, um, or you know, engaging in other relationships with people outside of the home. It, it could be a lot of different things happening um, if we're looking at the different types of relationships. And so these are the things that you would do or want to do if someone needs help. Listen, uh, and this is something really important uh, throughout that. The more listening you can do and the less speaking you do, I think in most instances, the better. Um, ask very clearly from the beginning, you know, what is this person wanting to get out of this experience with you? Are they here to vent? Would they like feedback? Um, what would the support look like from you right now? And when they tell you that, the listen is at asterisk again because it can be very easy despite what the person has clearly communicated what it is that they're looking for for you in terms of support for you to feel compelled to do something else and that's really common that's human nature that we want to be solution focused we want to help people but it's really just so important to stay focused on the fact that this should be a totally empowering experience where the person who is driving what's happening next is the individual coming forward to you to tell you that they're experiencing violence. Moving on, you know, don't interject judgment or power. Uh, don't make it about you. Sometimes people want to say things like, you know, why didn't you tell me this before? I can't believe you've kept this for me. Uh, quite bluntly, this is not about you. And whether or not someone chooses to tell you is not about you either. Um, and them telling you might not be in any way reflective of how they feel about you or your relationship, but that is their choice. And so that moment in time when they come to you, you're going to have lots of feelings. That's really important. That's really genuine, but you need to process them outside of that moment with that person and not push them back on them to make them feel any more guilt or make them feel like they've done something wrong. Um, and then, you know, move forward with their consent. Uh, this looks specifically if you're in a position where uh, they're coming to you in a professional capacity and you can't be confidential or you have to tell someone before they start telling you something, it'd be really important to let them know that so that they can make an informed decision about how they do or do not want to move forward. So that's an important piece of this as well. So think about that um, before someone's disclosed something to you. And, you know, um, times when you cannot keep someone's confidentiality or when you really have to garnish some some control is if someone tells you or communicates to you that they are an imminent threat of harm to themselves to others or anything that involves abuse with children that's a zone where it doesn't matter what that person's asking you to do it is important that you would then communicate that to officials or individuals who are in a position to do something about it so those are the areas um, where confidentiality or privacy are uh, would need to be breached and then I think it's important to acknowledge to this person, you know, and internalize it with yourself, how much courage and strength it took for them to speak up to you. This might be the only time they've told anyone about it. And that is such a privilege for you to be the person that they're deciding to share this with. So you want to um, be very careful with that. You want to um, treat this as a very fragile and important moment in this person's life and in your life. Things you also can do is research resources and options in your area. So have a list of phone numbers and locations available uh, ahead of time if you kind of are thinking that someone might be experiencing this. If in your professional capacity, someone might come to you with these issues, it's good to have this information on hand. Or if after meeting with that person, 
uh, they've asked you to gather more information or maybe they haven't, but you wanna have it on hand just in case they ask those questions. Um, you wanna work with that person to come up with safe plans for communication. People who are often in abusive relationships, uh, their partners or the person causing harm probably has access to their email, probably can change their passwords, probably checks their voicemails or text messages, and they might even be managing or going through those social media accounts. So you want to know with that person, what is a safe way for me to communicate with you? And then think of code words that you could use in an emergency. So meaning now that we know this safe mode of communication, what is the word I'm going to use or that this person would use to let you know that they need help right now? Um, so that is something that you'd work with them to come up with as well. Um, who else do you have permission to speak to about this? If the answer is no one, then you have no permission to speak to anyone else about this, or at least not give information that will put them at harm. With that said, you need to take care of yourself. And that might need to mean processing this experience with someone so that your emotional well-being is okay. So you want to make sure that you're seeking out that support without putting that person at risk of their privacy being breached or without risking um, that they will be contacted in some way that they're not comfortable with. Um, and also, again, a reminder, be prepared that this person may not leave the abusive relationship today, next week, or anytime soon. So the last thing I would say is that um, even if it's never something that's communicated to you, know that your help uh, is, is greatly appreciated. Uh, again, remind you that that person has come to you because in some capacity they trust you um, and they see you as someone who will support them and who will hold them up and empower them um, and help them despite what choices they do or do not make. Um, but again, keep in mind, remember, you can't pour from an empty cup. And if someone comes to you and you are not in a place to help them, it is okay to say, you know, I deeply care for you. I deeply appreciate you. And I am here to support you, but this is all I have to give right now too. So you could help them figure out ways in which they could seek out additional support or how you can be part of this journey with them. But maybe you, you have to be honest if you can't be with them in the capacity that they're looking for, or you can't help them in the ways that they're asking. Um, so this will require ongoing communication, um, ongoing transparency, and ongoing check-ins with yourself um, and self-reflection of how is this impacting you? Um, and are you being open and honest uh, with this person? And what do you need to take care of yourself as well? So thank you for watching. And again, please, if you have questions, email at title.ix at plattsburgh.edu. And additionally, uh, there will be a second video which will be more descriptive in terms of safety planning options. Thank you.